Hi, and welcome to our next edition of Byproduct Live. Um, this is where we unbox everything SaaS and product. We talk with experts and leaders in SaaS to understand real world challenges, product businesses face, and the approach that leaders take. And this week, I'm delighted to welcome Roman Smigel into the hot seat. Um, with approaching 30 years experience working, Roman really is an expert in building SaaS products. Originally from the US, Roman has lived and worked for the last 14 years in Berlin. He's worked at PayPal and then across a number of startups. He's a coffee aficionado and in his most recent role was able to blend his two passions together, coffee and tech, building a platform to expand access to speciality coffee as a co-founder. When discussing what topic to discuss with Roman, there were probably seven or eight really interesting areas of debate. But today we're discussing and focusing on ruthless prioritization. Prioritations, prioritization is absolutely key to building great products, but sometimes an area that gets lost as time building products progresses. So welcome today, Roman. Um, to kick things off, um, how would you describe what ruthless prioritization is? Yeah, ruthless prioritization is, you know, in this day and age with time equaling money and uh you know everyone is is in a rush to do things you have to quickly figure out what you need to do now and what you can do later and yeah. uh this is i think kind of in its core essence and i think there's like three or four core areas that we'll talk about that will kind of delve into this topic which is yeah. very very important i think to all cool great stuff so which would be the best area to start in so what, where would we discuss first of all? Yeah, I think I would I would start from this area where we want to solve the important uh, and hard problems versus the easy things. And I think a lot of times people are thinking, let's knock through the easy ones because, you know, it's fast. It can be simple. But if you really look at it, these are really, really difficult topics when we're building uh, new products, new companies and so on. And what it really requires, and you know, you may say, like, how can I ruthlessly prioritize all these things? Yeah. Well, first, it starts by really knowing your customer. And I think a lot of times people think, oh, it's just a matter of making a decision. But anyone can make a decision. But knowing who you're making a decision for, what is the job to be done that they're hiring you for? And a lot of times we talk about jobs to be done, and it's like a discussion point of, yeah, do this, do that. And it's not really that. The jobs to yeah. be done is really a topic of what is uh, a user hiring us to do that they can't solve themselves. Yeah. And it's really important because if you don't look at it that way, then you're tackling stuff that's not important to them. Okay. And, and kind of on top of that is like, I take the simple rule of the 80, 20 rule, you know, a lot of yeah. times uh, if you're looking at problems, you need to tackle the top, 20%, which is the hardest part, because it captures about 80% of the value for your customers. Yeah. And in that situation, would you involve the customer in that decision making? Or would you define that prioritization yourself? Yeah, it depends upon uh, your company. So you look at companies like Apple, where a lot of the people internally, they validate and they really know their user and they fight for their user quite extensively. But with companies that are a lot, a lot smaller and maybe not as robust in knowing the customer, going out and taking a hypothesis is very, very key. So I always tell people like everyone's like, oh, I think it should be this. I think it should be this. You take that as a hypothesis and you talk to a few people. And it's a matter of just creating a very short script, going out where your users are or where you think they are, and talking to them and validating whether your hypothesis is correct or not. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then um, as we move on in the discussion, wh where would you move that forward to to the next point? Yeah, I think when, when I look at it from the product space, a lot of times people... Uh, you hear a lot of product people as they start out and as they get older, too, uh, they tend to fall in love with the product, not with the mission. And I think <laughs> okay. we've spoken about this in the past, but yeah. uh, we really need to figure out that we're not building product for ourselves. You know, we yeah. come in into a different, uh, you know, salary range preferences, even though we may love it. Uh, you really need to build for your core users because they're yeah. the ones who will go out and buy it and make your product successful or not. 
And it's really going for this challenging stuff, not the easy stuff, like easy stuff anyone can do. And then they kind of knock you out and you don't have a unique selling proposition. And along these lines, you also want to focus on asking why, you know, why is it important? And a lot of times people will come to you and say, hey, what about this? We should do this feature. And you should ask why and then say no. Yeah. And when you say no, it's a hard thing to do, but you have to offer some options and alternatives. So yeah. what other ways can we tackle this? How can we solve this? Why is it important to the user? And I think this is really, really key. Yeah. And I think if people are building the product in how they think the product should work, of course, then it's not going to be built for optimal user experience, right? Yes, yes. And and I think this is also like you touch upon a very, very important point. Um it's about the experience much more so than the eye candy. So is your experience so great that, you know, no one else can replicate that. And I think this is a very, very key thing. People forget about this. So when I look at hiring, one of my first hires is always the user experience designer, because yeah. we need someone to get into the mind of the user, figure stuff out, really, really understand that well. Yeah, cool. No, that absolutely makes sense. And I guess, the, the kind of term ruthless prioritization, it sounds quite intense. I guess yes. it's about being able to explain what that is to the people in your team and, and your customers. And does this mean then that you've got to have the right culture um, to be able to embed, embed this into the ways of working? Yeah, yeah, and I think a lot of times people fail to realize that uh, if if you don't have the right culture and everyone is just looking towards you uh, or someone else and they don't really understand it, the, the prioritization doesn't go well because you're going in the wrong direction. And what this really requires is a psychologically safe environment for people. Okay. And people always get, you know, what is psychological safety? And you'll see lots of definitions. And the key thing is, is that you're with a group of people that you feel comfortable in saying all the things that come to your mind. Not the really crazy, weird stuff, you know, but like <laughs> things that are really, really important. And it yeah. also goes down to the next point of, you know, everyone saying, hey, give me a feedback. Uh, this should become synonymous. It should be continuous. You should be continuously having dialogue between each other. And then what it requires this culture is also to have empathy for others internally and externally for your users. Because if people are saying, I think it's this way, or I think it should be this way, it should be like, hey, I'm building for this person. I can empathize, not really sympathize, you know? Yeah. And if you get this, then this culture helps drive. And it's not just one person, but it's kind of like a round table of people going around ruthlessly, continuously doing this because it's never that the roadmap is set and it never changes. It should be a living thing or else you kind of die from perfection, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And do, do you think creating that environment comes down to each individual's personality or is it a way of working and something that can be be taught to people in your team? Uh, it is something that can be taught. That takes time. So when I, whenever I look at hiring people, I look at having shared values for the particular company. Yeah. And then when you pull someone new in and they come from a different culture, it takes about six to nine months for them to adjust. So either you give them the patience and if you don't have that patience, you need to really hire ruthlessly, essentially. So yeah. ruthlessly doesn't mean anything bad. It just means that you're very trying to do it as quickly as you can, but not uh, haphazardly. Yeah. And um, do you think this becomes more difficult at scale? Because obviously the more people that are involved in some of that decision-making and the bigger the teams, then does it make it harder to have a ruthless prioritization mindset? Well, it always comes down to, do you start off with a culture from the very beginning or are you trying to put it in at the tail end? So a lot of times what I've seen is that people like the organization is growing and they're not kind of taking care of the organization. So, you know, leaders are in charge of like being the gardener, you know, and if you let the garden grow and grow and grow and you don't properly prune it, uh, it's not <laughs> if you want to trim it down. It's wild, gonna... right? <laughs> yes, yes. So you really need to if you institute it initially and you grow it up, it's not a problem. But if one day you go, hey, we're so large, let's just do it you're going to have problems, 
because you have to kind of backfill and you have to teach everyone. And it takes about six to nine months. And that's the moment where you're worried that it's not going to work out. You're going to hit this low part and you're going to try to give up. And that's the moment to persist on. And if you have this kind of environment where you haven't grown it, you're going to have to go through that. And it's extremely painful. Yeah. And I guess just to start and wrap things up in terms of once you've embedded ruthless prioritization, what are the kind of key benefits that you start and see? You start to see, uh, you know, you will always make mistakes and you'll see a culture of learning. So uh, a culture that fears mistakes is a culture that doesn't learn. So you'll start to see things growing and your hit rate will be, Uh, You'll do more positive things than negative things, even though at times you'll kind of question it. But this is a part of learning. And if you don't do this, if you if you become totally risk averse, the the company and the product just starts to not grow at all. And then people look at other products and other solutions for them, because that's what users are continuously trying to do. They're looking for something better always. Yeah. Cool. That's brilliant. So as we just start and wrap things up, Roman, and I know we've taken yes. a very bite size um, kind of delve into ruthless prioritization today. What, what are the three key takeaways that anybody listening today should be taking away from this? Yeah, so I think the first one is solve only for the important hard problems and then everything else will come afterwards. Don't try to focus on everything. Yep. Make sure that you don't fall in love with the product, but you <laughs> yeah. fall in love with the mission, with this yeah. opportunity, with the journey. And then kind of the third point is, is culture is really necessary for ruthless prioritization. And this is just like a small, small piece. And when you fit it in all together, it works really well. If it's not working, then you have to focus on one of these three areas. Yeah, brilliant. Well, look, thank you very much for your time today, Roman. It's been r- super interesting. I know we've kind of started at a high level with this topic and there's lots to learn, but thank you very much for your time and we'll speak to you soon. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.